Well, good morning. I think we might get started, okay? So um, I'd like to welcome you all to our, our revital diseases and emerging and re-emerging public health threat, okay? Um, thank you so much for coming here, and I'd like to also thank Balneva for being supportive of this uh, symposium. And I'd like to introduce uh, the members of our panel. First, we have uh, the moderator today is Dr. Karen Kruger, uh, who is an assistant professor of infectious diseases at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. Uh, and she's also a medical director of the Northwestern Travel and Immunization Clinic. Okay. Then I'd also like to introduce um, um, Dr. Fernando Isern Borras. He's the president of Grupo Pediatrico de Caguas in Caguas, Puerto Rico, and assistant professor in the pediatric department at Ponce Health Sciences, University School of Medicine in Ponce, Puerto Rico. And myself, I'm Jorge Osorio. I'm the director of the Global Health Institute of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, okay? Um, so, obviously, we have been going through COVID and um, arboviruses continue to be there and a major important issue. And so I'd really like to thank Balneva for uh, supporting this symposium to bring awareness to the, the topic of arboviruses. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to have some housekeeping notes. So this is a non C presentation, so no credit will be given for this session. Uh, we ask that you please turn off your cell phones, you know, the ring is on your cell phone devices. And also, please um, don't take pictures um, from the slides if, if you can do that. Uh, so we'll wrap up with a question session, question and answer session after Dr. Kruger's um, presentation. Okay? And the staff will be waiting around with microphones uh, after the session, the, the question session um, for questions that you might have. We also have some um, um, cars on your, on your seats, so you can please um, fill those up, give us some background, and you know, give us some feedback on the, on the symposium. And at the conclusion of the program, we would like to complete an evaluation form, so that's also uh, given there to you. So uh, with no um, further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Kruger, and she's gonna talk to us about arboviral diseases and emerging and emerging public health threat. Thank you. All right, good morning everybody, and thank you for joining us so bright and early today. Um, so as Dr. Osario mentioned, um, the first half of the symposium, I'm gonna give a little bit of background information on arbovirus diseases, uh, specifically focusing on the big four, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika, and then we're gonna have plenty of time um, for an awesome discussion with our panelists today. All right, so let's get started. Um, so during the past 50 years or so, arboviral diseases um, epidemics have either emerged or re-emerged. And so we have a few examples of this include um, the around the mid kind of 2010s, the association of microcephaly um, and fetal malformations associated with Zika virus infection um, throughout Latin America. Um, there have also been yellow fever epidemics in Africa and South America, with the first yellow fever cases exported uh, to China um, around 2016, 17, somewhere there. Um, there's also been major epidemics of West Nile virus uh, throughout the Americas um, coming from Chicago. This is something that I deal with frequently, um, unfortunately. Um, and then the recent emergence in East Africa and the subsequent global spread of chikungunya virus. Um, and then the ongoing and expanding dengue virus pandemic um, throughout the tropics and subtropical regions. Um, so these epidemics of these diseases that have been around for a long time, ending up in new locations or having um, outbreaks in locations where they're already endemic, really highlight the urgency and the need uh, for control and prevention of arbovirus disease. Um, specifically today, we're gonna to be focusing on those uh, transmitted by the Aedes mosquitoes um, in, in urban areas. Um, so in terms of transmission, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika are typically maintained in, in zootic transmission cycles in forested areas. Um, and where this comes into play in terms of spreading human disease is when these mosquitoes end up in more urban areas um, and then we have subsequent um, spread with humans as the primary vertebrate hosts in these locations. 
Um, so Aedes aegypti tends to be the main vector for transmission of these bacteria. It tends to be a little bit more efficient in terms of uh, transmission. Although Aedes albopictus is also another mosquito that can uh, transmit uh, these diseases as well too, although a little bit less efficiently, but important to note because um, it can survive in a little bit of a more mild climate, so important in terms of climate change um, and changing location of these mosquitoes, potential introduction of these viral infections into immune-naive populations is an important consideration. All right, so thinking about factors leading to the spread of arbovirus diseases to locations where we haven't typically seen them previously, and again, also things that are allowing for more uh, outbreaks in endemic areas um, are definitely multiple, multifactorial. So first of all, we have uh, population growth and urbanization, and so kind of depending on socioeconomic status and sanitation, pooling water in urban environments, these can become breeding grounds for mosquitoes that are in close proximity to humans, again, tra potential transmission of the diseases. And then there's also spread of 80 species uh, to locations where they haven't previously um, been, and again, spread of these viral infections to mosquitoes in other locations. And so the flight of uh, the ability of the 80s mosquitoes to fly is actually pretty short, um, but with uh, travel and um, globalization of air transport, um, the eggs can be spread from these mosquitoes to other locations. Um, and again, the actual virus can travel in, again, either the mosquitoes moving around or in individuals who are returning um, you know, back from a trip or from a country where the disease is endemic and could potentially spread these viral pathogens um, to a local mosquito population that wasn't previously infected. Um, and then just the fact that we still don't have really effective vector control um, to deal with these mosquito populations and uh, to prevent the majority of these diseases um, short of yellow fever where we actually um, have a, a vaccine that can be given to a widespread population. All right, so now kind of focusing on each of these uh, four ar arboviruses um, separately. Uh, so chikungunya is in uh, alpha virus. It was first described in the early 1950s um, in an outbreak in Africa. Similar to kind of what we talked about, these are gonna be spread by our 80s mosquito species. There's four major lineages of chikungunya vaccine. So there's the Asian urban, the East Central South African, Indian Ocean, and the West African. Um, and kind of like we talked about on prior sides, the proximity of mosquito breeding sites uh, to where humans habitate is gonna be a significant risk factor for spread of chikungunya um, to populations. Um, so it's estimated that more than three quarters, so billions of people worldwide, are in areas where chikungunya is present and therefore remain at risk for the disease. Um, and the word chikungunya derives um, from an African language to become contorted or to bend up is the other translation that I've heard, um, kind of related to the um, severe arthralgias and arthritis that can result as a consequence of the disease. Um, so a lot of people who get chikungunya will remain asymptomatic, but for those who do develop symptoms, it's often characterized by um, a, a viral-like syndrome, so fevers, um, headaches, myalgias, uh, maculopapular rash is possible. Um, kind of the more unique aspect of chikungunya is the um, arthralgias and arthritis that can be short-lived but can also uh, potentially develop into a chronic form which can be severely disabling for individuals. Um, serious disease-related complications as opposed to yellow fever, dengue, um, are gonna be pretty uncommon with chikungunya, although possible. Um, and as of right now, there is no currently available vaccine or antiviral drug available for chikungunya, so care is really just um, supportive or treatment symptomatic. Um, so kind of from the 1950s to the early 2000s, there were really kind of just sporadic cases of chikungunya reported throughout Africa and Asia. Around 2006, we started to see increasing numbers of cases and outbreaks in areas where it was already known to be endemic. 
And so not surprisingly, a few years after that, you know, starting around 2010 to 2013, we started to see more imported cases in the United States coming back and returning travelers as we saw outbreaks start to happen in some of these other places. Um, and then in late 2013 is when we saw the first um, local transmission in the Americans, um, in the Caribbean. Um, and then we had kind of this explosion in the U.S. and territories around 2014 to 2017. So prior to that, there had maybe been dozens of cases imported into the U.S. And during this time, um, there were thousands of cases that were locally acquired or um, transmitted. And so this is when kind of, I think, chikungunya, at least in the United States, you know, really kind of grabbed everybody's attention um, and it was considered a nationally uh, notifiable condition at that point. Um, so since around 2015, 2016, the numbers have kind of slowly gone down over that time period. Um, but, in, but during that, we've seen millions of cases uh, related to that in the Americas um, in general. And again, it's interesting to see there's probably kind of a lull as well too related to um, kind of the stop in COVID related travel. And as someone who does a lot of pre-travel counseling, um, it's definitely something that's kind of upticking again. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with a lot of these diseases now that people are a little bit more uh, mobile again. Um, so I think we covered a little bit of this already, um, but uh, I'll also kind of just mention among kind of that big outbreak in 2014, 2015, uh, we also saw local transmission in the continental United States, so in Florida and Texas, in addition to the American uh, territories um, in the Caribbean. Uh, right. And so here's a map of imported cases year to date for 2022. Um, so we're definitely still seeing chikungunya in returning travelers. Um, I have to wonder too, if, you know, a non-specific you know, fever-like illness, if a lot of people are just kind of chalking this up to COVID or flu or something else as well too, um, if we could potentially be missing cases. But it's something, again, we're seeing in slightly smaller numbers, but um, definitely still, still present. Um, and just to dive a little bit more into the clinical pre presentation of chikungunya, um, there's kind of more of an acute phase, which we talked about, um, kind of the viral illness, and again, potentially these arthralgias, arthritis, and then the chronic phase of chikungunya, which tends to be this more kind of long-term, potentially debilitating um, arthritis that can be associated with it. So the initial symptoms typically develop between uh, three to seven days after um, a bite from the infected mosquito. Um, the polyarthralgia that is kind of more unique to chikungunya compared to the other uh, arboviruses we're gonna be discussing today typically affects um, fingers, knees, uh, um, ankles, toes, but can affect any joint in the entire body, it typically tends to be symmetric. Um, and then again, we kind of talked about uh, kind of some of our other nonspecific viral type syndromes, so headache, myalgias, conjunctivitis, um, a maculopapular rash. In general, these acute symptoms typically resolve within about a week or so. And then I kind of quote to people for kind of this potential developing um, the, the, the more chronic arthritis, arthralgias that, you know, maybe about half of people are going to end up with having these longer term um, symptoms at about six months and then a couple years later, probably about half of those may still end up having symptoms. So there actually is a pretty, even though the acute phase isn't necessarily that severe with chikungunya, uh, there are potentially some really severe long term um, debilitating sequelae for people. Um, so it's really important to be aware of that and I think that's one of the reasons why um, chikungunya is such an important virus to kind of still keep our eyes on. All right. All right, and then there are, even though I said most of our kind of primary cases of chikungunya tend to be mild, um, there certainly is a risk for more severe disease, um, so especially in older individuals or potentially immunocompromised individuals, um, and it can really affect any different organ system. So it's important to really keep chikungunya in mind if you're seeing a, a traveler uh, returning with an onset of a febrile-like or viral-like illness in the setting um, with any of these other things. So I actually have a case that I saw many years ago, a pre-pandemic of a patient who came in with really severe myocarditis and ended up in the CCU um, 
and was incredibly ill and that ended up, you know, we were, were a little bit surprised that that's what ended up being the diagnosis, but it's definitely something that's um, consistent and reported in the literature as well too. And so especially if we're seeing these huge outbreaks um, and epidemics, um, even if it's a small number, there definitely are going to be people who are going to unfortunately um, have these more severe side effects. And just challenges in diagnosing chikungunya. Um, so again, we kind of talked about a lot of the symptoms uh, with chikungunya are very nonspecific. Um, there can be co-infections. Um, so dengue, Zika, for example, they're transmitted by the same mosquito. So you could theoretically have more than one um, arbovirus if you're that unlucky. Um, and, you know, in industrialized countries, there is uh, pretty good access to testing, so PCR or serology, um, but in lots of parts of the world where we see that chikungunya is highly prevalent, there may not be um, readily accessible testing available to people. And again, since the illness can be self-resolving in most situations, um, it may not be something that people even seek out care for. So this makes it hard to really get a good estimate of how many cases of chikungunya um, are still out there. And I wonder too, with you know the COVID pandemic, were we testing as much for chikungunya, um, and were we able to really kind of put resources into tracking it as much as we were before the pandemic? Um, and so again, kind of as we mentioned, there's no approved vaccine to prevent chikungunya virus infection. Um, so really kind of the best that we have for right now um, is personal protection. So again, people who are living in areas where chikungunya is endemic or people traveling to areas to really make sure that they are taking um, strict precautions um, in terms of preventing mosquito bites. So again, you know, personal protective measures like DEET or Picardin, window screens, bed nets, permethrin um, on clothing, sleeping bags, etc. Um, and then there's kind of this idea of, you know, what can we do overall for, for vector control as well. Um, and yeah, so there's probably not one single intervention we can do. We probably kind of need to focus on um, kind of targeting multiple different aspects of, of prevention in order to, uh, to deal with the chikungunya. Um, but I definitely think this is one where increased awareness is important. Um, I was giving a, a lecture on fever and the returning traveler to individuals and I, in, in emergency medicine, and a lot of them were really unfamiliar with chikungunya in general. They were like, what is this? You know, maybe it vaguely rings a bell. So I think it's something compared to maybe dengue or yellow fever people aren't always um, necessarily aware of, um, especially practicing in the Midwest where this isn't something we see every day. Um, all right, so that's it for chikungunya. So we'll move on to dengue now. Um, so dengue is a flavivirus, again, an acute viral illness. Um, there are four different serotypes of dengue, um, and that's important. So, you know, getting infected with one serotype protects you against that serotype, but doesn't necessarily protect you against the other serotypes. And there's actually this phenomenon of antibody-induced enhancement, where if you get infected with a different serotype, you could actually have more severe disease um, compared to your initial infection. So important for people who are living in areas um, where dengue is endemic and it's not uncommon that they may be exposed more than one time. Um, dengue, similarly to chikungunya and the other viruses we're talking about today, are going to be spread by the Aedes mosquito. Um, and again, I think I mentioned this already, co-infection is also possible since we're talking about the same vector here. Um, so similar to chikungunya, dengue infections can be asymptomatic. Um, about 5% of people who get dengue will progress to the severe life-threatening form. So this is the one um, that we all have want to have a high suspicion for. And the reason why uh, we get so worried about dengue are these severe sequela and why we need to keep a high index of suspicion. Um, so just a little bit about the history of the spread of dengue. So we have known about dengue a very long time, um, so many hundreds of years. I didn't know that until I was uh, prepping for this presentation, but this is one that's been around and people have been aware of, which is not surprising, again, if it's causing such a severe syndrome like hemorrhagic uh, fevers. I'm sure people um, were quick to identify that. Um, and then uh, present day, so even though historically there were a lot of cases actually in the Americas, um, the majority of cases that we see right now are going to be um, in the Asian Pacific region, so probably about 75%.
Um, although, that being said, it's endemic in actually over 100 countries right now. Um, let's see. So again, kind of the, the Western Pacific, Southeast Asian, and the Americas being the most commonly affected. Um, and then new cases increasing, um, we've actually seen um, spread to other places such as uh, Europe as well too. So there was actually local transmission in Fran France and Croatia um, in 2010. Um, and then uh, local transmission was also seen um, in Italy and Spain as well too. So just kind of showing, we know that our mosquito vectors are present in Europe and the United States. So even though these diseases are not something we think about as much outside of the tropical and subtropical regions, um, the vectors are there, the viruses can get transmitted into these locations, and there is the possibility for local spread and introduction into these kind of more uh, naive populations. Um, so almost half of the world's population, so again, billions of people similar to chikungunya, uh, live in areas where they're going to be at risk for dengue. Um, and there are, this is I think actually one of, if not the most common um, viral um, mosquito-borne um, infection. So there's 400 million people infected annually. That's just a wild number um, with 100 million, because again, about 25% are going to develop symptoms, um, becoming ill related to that, and tens of thousands of people die worldwide every year from dengue. Um, and again, kind of talked about mostly endemic throughout the tropics and subtropics. Um, and then dengue, we see a little bit more in urban and residential areas compared to malaria, although the geographic distribution is overall fairly similar. Um, and then the number of cases of dengue reported to the WHO has increased more than eightfold over the last two decades. So you can kind of just see the little graph on the uh, lower left hand side, side there showing kind of that steep rise. Um, for the clinical presentation of dengue, um, there's kind of two major categories. So kind of our early dengue with or potentially without um, warning signals and then severe dengue, uh, which is going to be the form that we kind of dread and has the highest mortality associated with it. Um, so dengue fever in general, um, it starts very acutely, oftentimes with onset, sudden onset of a very high fever. Um, and again, kind of can be associated with nonspecific uh, influenza-like symptoms, so headache, myalgias, kind of the cla more classic presentation for dengue is that retroorbital headache. Um, and then kind of the break bone fever, so people will feel like they have pain in their bones or their joints. Um, and then nausea and vomiting, uh, rash is possible as well too. Um, and then hematologic abnormalities, so like a mild leukopenia and then potentially more severe thrombocytopenia can be associated with this stage as well too. Um, and then typically kind of in the early stage, you would see only minor hemorrhagic manifestations. Um, so if you guys remember or those who do clinical medicine, the tourniquet test where you inflate the cuff um, halfway, I think it's between the systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure. You leave it on for five minutes or so and then you'll count the petechiae. It's kind of a quick and dirty way to you know, look for potential um, dengue fever if you're again kind of seeing a fever in somebody in an endemic area who could have multiple different viruses. Um, and then dengue typically kind of after that initial phase, as people defervesce, they can kind of go to two, one of two ways. So they can re have clinical recovery or they can end up developing more of the severe manifestations of dengue. Um, so like more of like a hemorrhagic shock. So this is um, characterized by capillary leak and hemorrhage, multi-system organ failure, um, and then potentially shock as well too. And so it's really important um, to kind of be on the lookout for these signs and symptoms of individuals if they're developing se severe pain, persistent vomiting, tachypnea, they're starting to kind of bleed spontaneously from mucosal membranes. Um, and then, or again, if they're having hematemesis or bloody stools, these are people that you'd want to keep a much closer eye on. So even though treatment is supportive, um, having somebody, you know, giving them the right amount of fluids and blood products, things like that, um, can be really important in terms of reducing um, mortality in these individuals. Um, so you want to keep a high clinical index of suspicion. And then again, there's actually pretty good guidelines to follow clinically on how to manage these patients um, appropriately with, with kind of supportive intensive care. Um, so pretty much almost all cases of dengue in the United States um, have been imported from people who travel to locations where dengue is endemic. Um, 
Outbreaks in the continental United States are very infrequent, although have happened. Um, and then most of the outbreaks we've seen have luckily been very small and very geographically local, which is good, at least for now. Um, although, again, the local spread of dengue, just kind of like we've seen with chikungunya and Zika in the United States, is certainly possible since we do have the vectors here. Um, so, of course, remains a concern. Um, so just kind of challenges in diagnosing dengue are kind of overall similar to what we talked about with chikungunya. So first of all, again, there could be potential misdiagnosis because you can have uh, co-infection with our other herbaviruses. Um, and again, the symptoms are very nonspecific, could be mistaken for any other uh, uh, viral type illness, um, especially again, kind of COVID in these days, I'm sure has played a big role in how these things are diagnosed. Um, the, in terms of diagnosis, oftentimes during uh, the very acute phase, you can send for a PCR um, or you can actually send uh, an antigen test as well for a non-structural antigen. And then um, a little bit later in the course, you could send serology again looking for IgM in the initial phase to look for acute disease. All right. Um, and again, similar to all the things we're going to talk about today, unfortunately, we don't have any effective antiviral therapy. Um, so it's really just going to be supportive care. Um, there are, um, there have been some advances in uh, developing immunization for individuals against dengue. Um, but there's kind of been this concern too, again, about this antibody induced uh, mediated enhancement. Um, so the vaccine that's approved in the United States right now is really only for individuals who live in endemic areas, so typically like our U.S. territories, um, and have been previously exposed to dengue. So either had a positive test at the time when they had consistent symptoms or have serologic evidence of a prior um, infection. And in the U.S., it's only um, approved for individuals 9 through 16 years of age. Um, in other countries, I think the age... Um, uh, varies a little bit. I think it goes a little bit older in terms of, of what they're able to do. Um, and then there was another dengue vaccine that was just approved earlier this year, um, and again caused by any serotype, and this one was from ages 6 to 45. Um, and this is actually used regardless of previous dengue exposure, so you don't need that uh, pre-vaccination testing. Um, this one is not approved in the United States as of yet. Um, and so right now we don't have any vaccine um, for individuals just traveling to an area where they're at risk for dengue. Um, as of right now, this is just approved for people who live in endemic areas. So that's a question I get asked frequently um, by individuals who are going to be traveling to areas where there's potential outbreaks or high risk. Um, so again, additional vaccines um, would be a great step forward in prevention um, or expansion of what you know who are able to vaccinate. Um, so again, a lot of this for our travelers is really going to be that um, counseling on prevention uh, and taking those personal precautions against mosquitoes. All right, so on to yellow fever. Um, so another arborovirus disease, um, uh, also in the genus uh, Flavivirus, similar to dengue. Um, related to West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis virus, um, and those at risk, again, are going to be anywhere um, in countries where yellow fever is endemic, um, including travelers. Um, so yellow fever, luckily now, and I think this may be, you know, partly vaccine related as well too, is a really rare cause of illness in uh, U.S. travelers, so not something that we would see frequently in people coming back. Although again, if somebody hasn't been vaccinated or they're in an area where there's a large epidemic, should still be something that's considered. Um, it causes hundreds of thousands of cases um, every year and 30,000 deaths a year. Um, and 90% of these occur in Africa. The rest are going to occur typically in, in South America. Um, so illness can range in severity, again, from kind of a self-limited viral influenza-like febrile illness um, to kind of the severe manifestation um, with hepatic failure um, and bleeding or hemorrhage. So symptoms can resemble those of other diseases that are prevalent in areas where yellow fever is endemic, so specifically malaria, leptospirosis, or other hemorrhagic fevers. And kind of in the earlier, milder phase can mimic you know, a lot of the other um, arboviruses that we've talked about today as well, too, which can make diagnosis tricky. Um, 
Again, infection is going to be diagnosed based on laboratory testing, travel history, and then symptoms. Um, and there are no specific treatments for patients with yellow fever. Again, it's really just going to be supportive care. Um, and whenever possible, people um, should be hospitalized uh, for close observation because we know that these um, cases can end up with really severe uh, manifestations. Um, so just a little bit about the history of yellow fever. So similar to dengue, um, yellow fever has been around for a long time and has been causing uh, disease um, over a long period of time. So actually, there were a bunch of cases in the United States and um, even in the continental United States back when our nation was founded hundreds of years ago. Um, the last major outbreak in the U.S. was in New Orleans in the early 1900s. Um, and then since then, present day, we're really seeing yellow fever pretty much in the tropical and subtropical regions of um, Africa um, and South America. Um, and then, uh, of course, very important, the yellow fever vaccine was developed in 1937. Um, so here's just kind of a, a map that kind of just shows you the distribution typically where we're going to see um, yellow fever. Um, and then the transmission cycles, there's actually kind of three different cycles we see and there's a little interplay between both. So um, there's kind of the, the jungle cycle where uh, the virus is going to be transmitted between mosquitoes and then uh, non-human primates. There's going to be more the urban cycle where humans are the intermediary between the mosquitoes and then there's this intermediate cycle where they can be related between humans and our non-human primates. And so this kind of ongoing um, jungle cycle is going to keep yellow fever kind of alive and present and it's going to make it a little bit harder in terms of vector control to really get at that. And then again, as soon as these mosquitoes come into contact with more urban environments where we're seeing more close contact with human beings, that's when we're going to end up getting more of these outbreaks and, and human disease associated with it. The clinical presentation of yellow fever, um, so again, not everybody who gets yellow fever has symptoms. Some people are completely asymptomatic. Um, of those who do, oftentimes, again, these very nonspecific viral-like symptoms. Um, and the majority of people who get these are going to resolve within a week. Um, although some people may kind of have weakness and fatigue, maybe kind of this post-viral syndrome that lasts uh, for a period of months afterwards, um, which we can see with other viral infections as well, too. And then a few people are going to develop this severe form of yellow fever. Um, and so again, it's typically going to be you're kind of recovering from the first phase, and then within the next day or so, you're going to end up developing these manifestations of, of uh, severe yellow fever. So again, typically a really, really high fever. This is when you're going to see manifestations of hepatic failure and jaundice, kind of where yellow fever gets its name from, um, and then the hemorrhagic complications associated with it as well, which can uh, progress to shock and multisystem organ failure and death. And so among those who develop this form, you know, up to around half of those people are going to die within seven to ten days. So unfortunately, other than that supportive care, there's not a ton we can do uh, for folks once they get into this stage. So that's why we really want to prevent yellow fever, not only, again, for just all the morbidity associated with the initial viral infection, but really, again, the potential severe manifestations of this. And so this is just kind of another slide that kind of shows you the summary through of how most individuals will um, kind of go through this. And again, as I mentioned, there's tens of thousands of deaths worldwide due to yellow fever. Um, and then similar to kind of our other infections, um, again, can mimic a lot of other things. So physicians need to be aware um, if patients have been to endemic areas for yellow fever. Um, the clinical context is going to be really important in interpretation of results. If you're looking for serology, if someone's been vaccinated, that could obviously make your diagnosis more difficult. Um, so those are just some of the challenges that we see as well, too. Um, so prevention for yellow fever vaccine, um, so we kind of talked a lot, again, about importance um, of personal uh, protection and precautions, which is easier said than done to get people to use their DEET every day and use their mosquito nets. Um, but again, really, really emphasizing that with people living in these areas or traveling to these areas. But vaccination is going to be the most important means um, in preventing yellow fever. So we do, this is one where we do have a great vaccine that's available uh, to people living in endemic areas and to also travelers who will just be going there. And not only do we have the vaccine, it's actually mandated in a lot of the places that you're going to travel to. So I have people who won't take any vaccines at all, but they will take the yellow fever vaccine because they need to go on their trip. So sometimes 
<laughs> that can be helpful. Um, so it's recommended for anyone nine months of age and older, either traveling or living into um, Africa or South America. Um, the vaccine is live, but it's overall really safe. Um, the risk of severe sequelae are, are, are very, um, very low, and again, much lower than the risk of having yellow fever uh, disease if you're going to an area where it's endemic or there's outbreaks. Um, and in general, it's thought to really provide lifelong protection against yellow fever. Um, we typically used to give a booster every 10 here, although now we're not doing that frequently, although it may still be considered if somebody is going to an area where there's an outbreak or really high rates of transmission. Um, and again, you have to always check where you're going because some countries may want you to have had that booster within 10 years. So it's important to just kind of be aware of where individuals are traveling to. Um, and we had a long break where we didn't have local yellow fever vaccine um, manufacturing in the United States, um, but we do have it back again now, so that is wonderful. Okay, and last but not least, we have Zika. Um, so again, another flavy virus. Um, again, transmitted kind of through our same mosquito vectors here, so we kind of have a theme with what we're talking about today. Um, and again, non-human and human primates are gonna be uh, the main reservoirs of the virus. Um, and then also, again, there can be human to vector to human uh, transmission occurring during outbreaks as well too. Um, and then perinatal and uterine and uh, sexual transmission and transfusion related transmission events have all been reported as well too. Um, so outbreaks of Zika have been uh, recorded for a long time in Africa, the Americas, Asians, and the Pacific. Um, pretty much kind of rare sporadic cases. Um, and didn't get a lot of attention because again, most of kind of the initial cases that we see tend to be more on the mild side. Um, but in 2015, Brazil reported an association between Zika virus infection and congenital abnormalities, um, with the big one being microcephaly. Um, and at this point, there was also kind of a kind of a huge outbreak, and I think we started really identifying uh, Zika a lot more frequently. And there was a lot of research done into all these potential complications, specifically um, around the um, around women who are pregnant. Um, and so since that time, there have been almost 90 countries and territories that have reported evidence of mosquito-transmitted Zika in, uh, infection. Um, and then again, we kind of talked about the risk during pregnancy. So not only the microcephaly, congenital abnormalities, um, but also potentially fetal loss, uh, stillbirth, and preterm birth. Um, so again, kind of just reiterating it on the timeline here. So the first human case um, was discovered um, in the early 1950s. I think it was identified in primates previous to that. Um, and then again, kind of just these sporadic cases. The first major outbreak was in Micronesia in 2007. Um, so it got some attention at that point. And then again, 2015, Brazil noted um, this huge increase of, of cases of these uh, viral illnesses often associated with a rash. And then again, kind of made the connection to the fetal abnormalities and the microcephaly. And then in 2016, it was declared a public health emergency by the WHO. Um, and then we actually saw some local transmission in the United States. Um, but over the last few years, things have seemed to quiet down a little bit in terms of Zika. We haven't had any local mosquito-borne Zika virus um, in the continental US, I think since like 2018 or so. Um, so here's just kind of a map uh, where you can see countries and territories with current or previous Zika virus transmission. So pretty broad involvement worldwide. Um, so most people with Zika virus do not develop any symptoms associated with it. And those who do will often kind of, again, kind of have our nonspecific uh, viral-like illness, fever, um, often associated with a macupapillar rash, conjunctivitis, um, arthralgias, malaise, headaches. Um, symptoms are typically mild and maybe last for a couple of days up to a week. Um, the severity of disease requiring hospitalization is really uncommon, and case fatality in general is, is extremely low. Um, and then preliminary diagnosis, again, is kind of going to be based on a compatible clinical illness, um, travel to a place, and you know, the correct incubation period. Um, and then again, we do have testing, both uh, PCR and uh, serologic tests as well, too. 
Um, there is no specific antiviral treatment for Zika. Again, treatment is just generally going to be supportive. Um, and like I said, most people who get the infection don't have terribly severe courses and it's just typically self-limiting. Um, and so really important, again, to um, have personal mosquito protections um, and, again, consider ways that we can also deal with, um, you know, the vector at large um, from a global stance. Um, but really, really important consideration needs to be given to um, individuals of reproductive age and their partners in terms of travel. Um, so again, we haven't really had any major outbreaks in the last few years. Again, I don't know how good surveillance has been in a lot of places related to COVID-19 when a lot of public health resources were kind of, um, you know, dealing, dealing with the pandemic at large. Um, but there's still definitely possibility of transmission in, you know, these locations that have uh, these uh, mosquito vectors. And so I think really important to still make sure. I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten about Zika <laughs> now with the pandemic and it hasn't really gotten much media attention. It's something I, get, I used to get asked about every single day in my job when this kind of first came out in the late um, 2010s and now I have to remind people and they're like wait what Zika is still a thing so I think it's important that we make sure people still are aware of that and the potential uh, sequelae associated with this in people of reproductive age and their sexual partners and again no vaccine yet available for the prevention of Zika virus okay so that wraps it up for me so I'm going to give you guys a break um, and we're going to actually um, uh, to talk a little bit with our panelists here. Um, so I'm gonna start just by kind of going through a couple questions um, that I have prepared for them, and then we're gonna have plenty of time to kind of open it up to the audience as well too. Um, all right, so my first question is gonna be for Dr. Ethern. Um, so why do healthcare providers need to know about arbovirus diseases, and what do they need to know? Well, good morning to all. First of all, thank you for being here. Uh, they're this early morning to learn about uh, these arboviral diseases. Uh, second of all, thank you for Valneva for organizing this and bring Dr. Kruger, Dr. Osorio, and me to speak to you uh, what, what we can. Uh, the question, uh, what do health, uh, health providers should, uh, ne should need uh, to know uh, about uh, arboviral diseases because, first of all, they could be in an endemic area. Like I live in Puerto Rico, and in Puerto Rico, this is an endemic area where we have the Aedes aegypti. So we have the whole, the whole, uh, the possibilities of dengue, Zika, chikungunya, uh, yellow fever. No. Uh, second, if you do not live in an endemic area, but uh, you live in a place where there is the vector, like say in certain areas of Florida or or, or Texas, uh, you might have uh, somebody come from the outside in. Uh, and how you could have a uh, local transmission of the disease, so you must know the symptoms of arboviral uh, diseases. Uh, third, you should also uh, know uh, that if you're going to travel, to, if somebody's going to travel, they're not necessarily going to go to a travel doctor first. They're going to go to their primary doctor, and their primary doctor should know about the possibilities of where they're going. If you're going to Alaska, you, you should not worry too much about these arboviral diseases, but if you're going to a, a, one of the the, the 60 percent of the, of the world that, that that does carry these diseases then uh, you should uh, warn them you should alert them and you should know the all the precautions that they should take the last thing you should know is when your patient comes back if you have a patient who comes for, with with fever and and you say it's just a, a rhinovirus or something but you have we had a recent travel to an endemic area then uh, it might be a viral, viral disease. So you should know the signs and symptoms, which, is, as mentioned, uh, they, they call the intra. They're more or less, uh, basically more. They're uh, more or less the same. Uh, but you should also ask them if anyone in their family has traveled and if, if there's a vector in that area. Uh, uh, what uh, What do you need to know? Need to know what what was what was explained here how it can be manifested, uh, the things like uh, most diseases, uh, uh, the majority are asymptomatic, but maybe someone uh, uh, in, in, in the family is symptomatic. So you should uh, have a close, of, uh, not only a physical exam, but a, a history. Be a, like a detective and, and try to think, if, you, if you've traveled or in your endemic area, you should try to find out uh, more about the, the possibility of them 
you have to suspect they have, they, they can have an arboviral disease. Wonderful, thank you. Um, for Dr. Osorio, how would you rate the level of awareness of arboviral diseases among U.S. clinicians? Oh, thank you, Dr. Kruger, <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here as well with Dr. Eisern and some of you. Um, and not being a, a physician, but from my experience in research, and I'd like to give you my comment. Um, obviously, in the U.S., we are familiar with diseases like West Nile. You know, we had a whole history with West Nile in, in, in many parts of the U.S. Um, but obviously, as you go in different parts of the U.S., um, there's different demographics and changes in population. So I would think um, uh, people in the south and the, the eastern coast and some of the Pacific coast where there is more Latin population have the experience of, of dealing with um, some arboviral diseases because some of their patients might come from, some, from endemic areas. Also, some, some medical doctors um, that have traveled and have done international work also are quite familiar um, dealing with um, some of these arboviral diseases in some of those parts of the world. So that's my comment, not being a physician, but I, maybe I'd like also ask to ask Dr. Eisen if, you know, what, what you think about that as well. Do you think that their physicians are also very aware of arboviral diseases? I would, I would say no. <laughs> I concur, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I try to do a lot of education for like, you know, urgent care, emergency medicine physicians, because it's a lot of times I think, you know, a traveler returning uh, with a fever, a lot of times that's really where they're going to come into contact with. And I would say a lot of times people have, you know, kind of like a vague recollection of, of studying diseases at some point, but since it's not really something that we're seeing every day, it's not always the first thing that, that people think about. So, and infectious diseases, of course we do, but, you know, not everybody always has an infectious disease. Uh, doctor on site available to kind of to work through that so it's definitely something where I think education is really important um, especially among providers who are kind of the first line for seeing people that are ill all right it's, it's not something that you should be ashamed of because uh, like uh, you asked me about Rocky Mountain spotted fever I've never seen one because I do not live in that area but I should know that if you've been traveled there that uh, I then and, and come up something with a tick-borne illness then I should either know about it or contact someone. So we're living in an area in a time where uh, the travel and uh, things are, are going so uh, weird that we should be more uh, suspicious of, uh, of think if we th if we continue to think that what we know is correct will become obsolete in, in a couple of years. So we, we need to keep coming to the symposia or learning things through uh, the lectures. Absolutely great. All right, uh, Dr. Isern, do you think that travelers are aware of arboviral diseases in general? Um, and how often do you think they take proper precautions prior to travel and consult with a travel medicine provider, kind of go along with recommendations for mosquito protections, things along those veins? I think I'm going to abuse with the no. <laughs> if you're going to travel right now, you, you have a lot to worry about. And one of the things that comes to mind is uh, if, 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 if you don't know, if, if you're going to, uh, there, there's two types of travelers. There's the uh, routine traveler. There's the one, that the business person, who usually goes to Brazil or goes to South Africa. Maybe they know because it's, it's a, they're accustomed to them. And there's uh, the, just the, the tourist or the, uh, the, the, the seasonal travelers who come to work here and go back. They may know because they, 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 they've been there. But the one who, who's traveling uh, on a business, a small, short business trip or a f family vacation or something, they're worried about a whole lot of other things. So they're not worried about this, which is not known to the, uh, most of the public. And the first person they're going to contact is their primary care provider. So it's the primary care provider who should be aware of this. And if they don't know, they should refer them to a travel doctor. They could get in contact with the State Department or the, the Department of Health, but it would be answered by a lay person who just would open and says, okay, you need, okay, you need the yellow uh, fever vaccine, and that's it. They won't say, oh, oh, there's also dengue, so you should use insect repellents, you should use uh, 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 long sleeve uh, and, and pants and, and things. So uh, the, the, the traveler is not, it's not on their fault, but they're not quite aware. The second part of the question, uh, uh, do they take proper uh, precautions? No, and if they don't know them, they, they, they don't they'll take the, the proper precautions. And the biggest uh, threat to travelers 
is especially in repeated with dengue specifically, which is the big one. If you're traveling, going back and forth, you might have uh, the second time you, uh, you might have gotten bitten than the first time, and you had no symptoms. Eighty percent do not buy, uh, have them, but the second time you go, then you might really might get sick. Uh, or, or you should know where you're traveling. Right now, we like you mentioned, we have no outbreaks of chikungunya. But I remember the the 2014-15. Chikungunya, you could diagnose it by seeing the patient walking into the office. They, 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 that contorted thing. They walked uh, strangely. They, they couldn't clench their hand. It was, it was all uh, clinical. So uh, the, what they should uh, know is that you should contact whenever you're traveling outside of a known place. You're going from one state to the other. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be uh, necessary. Or if you're, you're already in an endemic area, you come, you're in a part of Brazil and about to go to the other, it's more or less the same thing. But if you're going to someplace different, you should contact your primary care provider and if, if not, a travel doctor. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I think kind of the most people who seek out our pre-travel um, counseling and clinic are people who come in with a specific agenda, like wanting malaria prophylaxis or needing the yellow fever vaccine or an update on their typhoid. So I think a lot of these other diseases may not be on individuals' radar. And so that's a great opportunity, again, for a primary care doctor or a travel doctor, whoever, to really kind of counsel people on all the things that we don't have vaccines protect and all the precautions that people need to, to take with mosquitoes. So we spend a lot of time counseling on that, but I know a lot of people don't necessarily make it to that step where they're receiving that counseling. And then again, when you're on a vacation to remember to be putting on your DEET and all that other stuff can sometimes uh, be a challenge for people um, as well too. So I think kind of the more information they have on how important it is to prevent these things, the better. And again, I think the Zika question is interesting too, because again, everyone always came to me for pre-travel counseling for Zika. And now I think just since it's not really in the media, it's not on everybody's radar. So I don't know that everyone's really considering um, that as well too. Another caveat is they, they, they consult Dr. Google. And Dr. <laughs> Google is, is not only uh, can lead them to a false sense of security, it can lead them to a false sense of hy hysteria. So uh, they should try to establish the primary doctor as the point of, of getting that information. All right, for uh, Dr. Osorio, which of the arboviruses we spoke about today do you consider the biggest threat to those living in the Americas and the biggest threat to travelers? Yeah. So, so I think arboviruses in general continue to be a major threat. Um, dengue to me is one of the most important ones as you show in your uh, presentation. Um, all those four serotypes, you know, the dengue can easily um, be is endemic in many parts in, in, in the Americas, and you know the serotype can change um, depending on year by year. But we also uh, have seen these explosive outbreaks of uh, chikungunya, and that happens in, in, in Asia and Africa on a periodic basis. So even if we just had in the past you know seven or eight years an outbreak of chikungunya, when we have a decline in the seroprevalence in the population, these viruses tend to emerge and, and they can do uh, explosive outbreaks. Another issue that I think we can keep in mind is the ability of these viruses to adapt to new vectors. You know, they can easily mutate. That happens also with chikungunya that adapted to, uh, to Aesopictus and, you know, it spread their range. So we could see that happening here as well. We could see chikungunya that, um, you know, adjust to Aesopictus and and, and it could significantly um, have a major concern in the U.S. because we have a large population of uh, pictus in the U.S. But there is also emerging arboviruses. We are doing fever clinics in Colombia, and we are finding um, in patients that, for example, that are negative for dengue, uh, Zika, or chikungunya, we are finding new arboviruses. And I, there's one that we reported this week, and uh, that's Oropuche. Oropuche is transmitted by culicoid mosquitoes, and it could easily uh, be um, in many parts of the of the Americas, we we then look in Brazil and it's second the second um, second to dengue in Brazil. So it's actually a very present arbovirus. So to me, uh, we, and also with the climate change, we can see that this uh, the range of the mosquitoes is, is is increasing in many parts of, of the world. So we have dengue in in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So it easily can spread up up north as well. So kind of along that vein, are you concerned about the potential for increased arbovirus transmission and spread in the United States? I know we've seen some transmission in Florida, Texas, and we know that these mosquitoes are present here. 
Absolutely. I think we, we, we see the potential of these arboviruses to spread and to establish maybe endemic cycles in some parts of the U.S. And we have some parts of, of uh, Florida uh, that we have transmission in Texas as well. So I think we can see that potential. And again, if, if they can do a single change in, and adapt to a new vector, we, we could have these this new cycles that they, it could spread to different parts of the U.S. So I think to me, uh, it's definitely a major concern. And also to see these emerging arboviruses because we, we live in a global economy, so we travel everywhere. So easily we can be, um, you know, in, in a different place and, and biomic come to the U.S. and establish a cycle for, for any of these emerging arboviruses. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Is. It is not temperature that is keeping yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika out of the United States. Mm -hmm. It is running water, air conditioning, uh, screening. Uh, someone also mentioned bed nets. Bed nets are worthless for these diseases. Aedes aegypti bites during the day. So unless you're sleeping in your bed net during the day, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, that these diseases are anthropogenic diseases. You need a mosquito that feeds on a person and a person and a person. Uh, by the way, an albopictus for chikungunya, if you go back into the 20 years before that outbreak, albopictus is a much, much more efficient vector of chikungunya virus than aegypti with or without that mutation. Mm -hmm. But it is in generally a poor vector in the real world. It's an efficient laboratory vector, but because it feeds on anything, it's an inefficient vector in the real world because it will pick up the virus from a person and transmit it to a dog, and the virus does not produce a viremia in the dog. Uh, in the area around the Indian Island Oceans, there were very few dogs, lots of albopictus, other, very few other animals to feed on, so albopictus became a very efficient vector. Uh, the mutation that enhanced slightly the ability of albopictus to transmit the virus occurred at the end of the outbreak. It didn't cause the outbreak, it came as a result of it. The big outbreak in the Americas did not have that mutation. Correct. Uh, it, millions of cases. That these diseases are not occurring, these four diseases are not occurring in the continental United States because we have running water, air conditioning, screening. Uh, that's why they're not here. They are not tropical diseases. They're diseases of the tropics or of lower socioeconomic status. If you don't have running water, you are at high risk of dengue, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever. Uh, yellow fever, oh, one other just minor comment. They are not transmitted by Aedes. They are transmitted by Aedes aegypti and maybe Aedes albopictus. Aedes are also the vector of lacrosse virus. That's Aedes triseriatus. They're also, Aedes are also the vector of Venezuelan equencephalitis virus. Oh, that's Aedes tenuricus. There are hundreds of different AD species, and each of them, is, each of these diseases, is a specific mosquito, mm -hmm. not AEDES, because mm -hmm. it scares oh. me. <laughs> uh, but this is really, I'm really, really important. Your talk was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you. Um, all right, uh, for Dr. Isern, how frequently do you see patients present with one of these diseases in your practice? Well, currently, uh, we have an outbreak of uh, dengue in Puerto Rico. I see them almost uh, every day, either at, at the office or at the uh, ER. Uh, and uh, we basically have to just uh, monitor them. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't had any, any deaths yet, but we see uh, uh, a lot of uh, 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 hemoconcentration, low blood, blood cells, the, the typical, it, it is, it, with uh, dengue, the, the pain on the eye, the retroviral the pain, which is caused by the movement of the eye muscles, it is very, uh, very characteristic. And once you, you have that, you almost have that diagnosis. And uh, basically, it's the follow-up. And 
we in, in Puerto Rico, since we live with this, uh, it's obligatory for all the doctors to take uh, every three years a course in dengue specifically, and did now with uh, COVID also. Uh, so uh, we're, 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 this is something that we live through with, with every day. And we passed uh, the chikungunya and we passed the Zika outbreak also. So it's, it's getting to know where you're going and wh uh, what are the, uh, the epidemiological uh, things that are going on in, in that, uh, that area that, that, that you're going right now. And uh, the, if you get a, uh, we say eradicate them by using uh, long sleeves and, 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 and using uh, uh, sprays and things like that. Well, we know that obesity is caused by eating too much food. Has anybody solved it by saying do not eat too much food? No. So tell, telling people to go to the tropics and use long sleeves uh, uh, shirts when they want to go to the beach and things, and just like uh, the doctor mentioned, the Aedes aegypti uh, bites during the day. It's usually um, uh, an urban mosquito that uh, in, in areas where there, it used to be uh, in, in the woods, but uh, it's it, it usually under the beds in the closets, and uh, it, like we're talking, we don't we don't feel the bite as, as much as, as the other. So we the the main thing we're having right now is dengue, and it's it, it's cyclical. It's coming back. About every, every five to ten years, we have a spike. And another thing is, is that you tend to look at the uh, is it epidemic or is it endemic? Is it above above the uh, epidemic threshold? You have to be careful for that because the, it flows with the rainy seasons. And right now, it's the rainy season, so we might have, a, we're not in an epidemic, because, but the, the incidence about, is about 10 times what it was a couple of months ago, which the incidence is lower. So even though it, we're not in an epidemic, you're, you uh, have more chances of, being, of, of, of getting bitten by a mosquito and getting dengue. Uh, with the other ones that we haven't seen Zika uh, in quite in, since the last outbreak, the chikungunya uh, either. Thank you. Dr. Osorio, do you think that arboviral diseases in general are underdiagnosed? Um, and do you think is, is one more underdiagnosed than the other? Um, absolutely. I think we have an issue with diagnosis, like you mentioned. Um, and even it got worse with the epidemic of Zika because we saw a lot of. Uh, Cross reactivity in diagnostic tests uh, between Zika and, and dengue as well, and so there needs to be some work in trying to improve diagnostics, trying to make them more specific, um, and also um, more available. And I think we need maybe a panel of, of arboviral diagnostics, and, and obviously, some companies are working on this as well. Uh, but uh, again, there are some arboviruses that are emerging, as I mentioned, the work that we are doing in, in Colombia. We have. Um, you know, Oropuche, but we found it by, by you know, different methods, doing PCR testing and, and molecular diagnostics, but we need to make things that are a little more practical for better diagnostics. Thank you. Dr. Isern, given the overlap in symptoms among several of these diseases, what do you think should be the first steps in making the correct diagnosis, and how do you approach these patients in your practice? Well, the first uh, step is suspecting that it may, you may have an arboviral disease, be whatever it, it is. Uh, it's not just a common cold or something. If you have travel, if, you, if you're in a high, uh, like, like we now have high season for, for dengue, then you have to suspect it. And you have to go one step further. Uh, you haven't traveled, but has anyone, uh, you, you, have, you, have, you used to ask in your family, is anyone sick in your family? No anyone sick in your household because they may say okay am i his 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 father is sick with the same symptom with symptoms similar but he lives uh 50 miles away so it's it's not the same thing and he hasn't been in contact with him with in three weeks then you have the different illnesses so you have to uh ask about the the patient and the patient's household and the patient's environment in his school the the, uh, the kids uh uh uh, is sick in school, in your workforce, in your, uh, your where do you work? Do you work in the open field? Do you work in a, a well-contained uh, uh, center like this with air conditioner and things like that? Is anybody sick? So the first thing is being suspicious and, and uh, that, that you, you may have the, di the diagnosis. Second thing is treatment. Treatment is basically the, th the same thing for all. Uh, take care of the hematologics, make sure they're 
they're well hydrated, they're not hypovolemic, there's no hemoconcentration. So more important than making the correct diagnosis because we have problems with the testing and with the availability of testing, and depending on the, the state or the government, uh, how you, can you get back uh, the information? In Puerto Rico with the, the, the chikungunya, when we had the outbreak, uh, we used to test it in the, uh, the ER rooms, and the ER rooms uh, sent back the information back to the ER doctors. And the, the ER doctors said, all of a sudden we found out the ER doctors aren't the, 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 their primary care uh, giver, so the information never got back to the patients or their doctors to warn about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the family or uh, the, the, it's improved now with COVID that they do uh, surveillance for, for areas so they can see if, they, if there's an, an area, of, of, especially of dengue, of high a incidence of, of getting in the, the infection. So it's just uh, detective work. Great, okay, one last one for me and then I'm gonna open it up. Dr. Osario, what are some global measures that are being taken to prevent arboviral diseases? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, I think there's different methods in practice now being, being studied of mosquito control uh, using some biological control methods, um, either Wolbachia or some other methodologies. They're trying to, um, they're, they're showing some promise in, in different parts of the world to, to block um, arboviral transmission in general. But also, you know, some other uh, practices that we normally do with um, insect repellents and, and wearing more protection are, are, you know, normal practices that we can do to uh, try to prevent um, arboviral diseases. And finally, you know, I think we are, there's different efforts that you mentioned on, on vaccine work that actually are, are they show a lot of promise. They, they think a vaccine is, um, is, seems to be, um, you know, like you mentioned, approved in different parts of the world. So I think that's, that's going in the right direction and there is a lot of promise for a chikungunya vaccine. The concern that we have also is um, some of these diseases come and go sometimes. So um, to have vaccines for um, some, some of them when they, are, when they are not in that large peak, when we have that large peak of cases, it's difficult to have a vaccine that goes all the way to uh, complete uh, clinical trials, the phase three clinical trials. But, I think overall, you know, all this effort of prevention by different methods, vaccines or um, vector control methods or some other uh, practices that we're using, using different, different chemicals for protection of, of mosquito repellents, uh, they seem to be working quite well. Great, thank you. All right, I'll open up to you guys if you have any questions. Hi, good morning. Great presentations by all the speakers and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, talking of endemic areas, you're talking about the physicians here, but in, the, in the endemic areas, they have an opposite problem. A patient goes in with acute, acute febrile illness, okay, you have dengue. <laughs> with no diagnostic method, nothing. They won't even check for the simple symptoms and they'll call it a dengue, go home, take rest, stay mm -hmm. hydrated. That's all the treatment that's given and then suddenly the patient's going into thrombocytopenia and is hospitalized. So how do you uh, propose that those people who are seeing this day in, day out also have easy diagnostic methods and really check for it as soon as the patient comes in? Want me to take it? Okay. So I, I think the issue is definitely, like you mentioned, um, we have to have testing available and more practical because um, unless you have something that you can test right there with the patient, okay, and it can give you a test in, in 15, 20 minutes, um, it comes useless in my opinion, okay? So, and some of the places, um, there is centralized testing. So even the samples have to go to a central lab and by the time you get results is like a few weeks later and then you miss the, the whole thing. So I think, you know, I think one of the efforts that has been shown also with the, with the COVID pandemic is the need to improve testing. And that needs to be done for arboviral diseases in general. We need to improve a panel that in the same panel, basically you can have all different arboviruses in one rapid test and be able to, diag to diagnose them. So I totally agree with you. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Let's go in the, the same direction. Actually, I'm a doctor, 
I'm professor at the School of Medicine in Bahia, and also I'm uh, an investigator for the Oswald Cruz Foundation. Uh, I think that we should also add some uh, word. Uh, especially if you had a, a rent, during rent season, eight days after a very strong rent season, you have to put in consideration like touch paralysis. Mm -hmm. Actually, for my friend Albert Co, who did this in Brazil <laughs> several years ago, mm -hmm. we had a dengue outbreak very strong in Salvador City, and a lot of individuals that look for the doctor, they just give the diagnosis for dengue and send them home. And eight days later, they came back to the hospital mm -hmm. and they had leptospirosis, paralysis. And actually, 30% died. Mm -hmm. And were men that were head of family and left three, four kids. So in several areas, should have also put in consideration leptospirosis as a differential diagnosis. Yes, I would agree uh, that, that uh, you may you have, have to have the suspicion, but you cannot have blindfolds that they can have another thing, other things, uh, many illnesses, left of cirrhosis, and all and other hemorrhagic diseases is one of the the main ones, especially if, if there's a wet season, or you're in the woods, the the child or the patient walks without uh, 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 barefoot, uh, so you have to take that into context. And uh, it depends on the area. If 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 you have uh, if they're aware of these of leptospirosis and or other uh, illnesses, uh, but it, it it becomes a part on just like the previous question on the part of the physicians. What am I going to do with the resources that I have? And yeah. like Doctor said, we should uh, uh, have more testing available, be more aggressive, and and just say it's. it's it, in pediatrics, we say, it'll just go away. <laughs> sometimes, 90% it does, whatever <laughs> we do, but sometimes it doesn't. And we cannot miss those that it doesn't, and we should be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I was just going to add to that same thing, and that is that when I was in Ecuador, there was a huge number of cases of dengue. How do you diagnose dengue? You come into a clinic with a fever. The first thing they do is a finger stick. If it's positive for malaria, you have ma malaria, give you chloroquine. If you do not have malaria, you have dengue. They send you home. A study in Peru took similar patients and did acute convalescent serum on a many, many, many dengue cases. They found that 90% of the classically identified dengue cases had no evidence of dengue whatsoever. Mm -hmm. What these other 90% were, nobody knew. Mm -hmm. But you had leptospirosis. You had a whole bunch of other diseases which were identified in some of these. So it's, we need better diagnostics mm -hmm. because we need to know which diseases are found in which area so that we can provide good information to how to avoid these. Which mosquitoes do we control because they're different for different viruses? Mm -hmm. What behaviors do we need to avoid doing because they put us at greater risk for certain diseases? I don't know how, and MAP is I hopefully trying to get the better diagnostics out to the clinician so that we can identify what the real diseases are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to imagine there's a lot of diagnostic bias both ways. So in countries where there's a high prevalence of these diseases, you just make an assumption. And in an area, you know, like the Midwest of the United States, you probably barely think about these diseases. And so they're kind of last on your list. So, um, yeah, I imagine that plays into it quite a bit. We do have some questions here. Is that okay if we read them? Okay. So how many of these um, diseases um, discussed are humans capable of transmitting the virus to mosquitoes and thereby continuing the cycle. So I think it's all of them, you know, that we talk about that, that basically humans are the ones that are amplifying hosts in some of those cases. And in some of those cases, there might be some reservoir hosts that are able to maintain that cycle. So that's just some of the case. Do you recommend past travel precautions for patients returning from endemic areas? Can I, can, maybe can I ask you, uh, Dr. Dr. Kruger, do you recommend post-travel precautions for patients returning from endemic areas? Um, no, I, I um, so I guess in terms of, of Zika, we, you know, if somebody is going to an area, especially if there's, you know, known active outbreak or potential transmission, we will counsel individuals on 
um, you know, the, the potential risk, and then they can kind of make that decision about whether or not they want to abstain from um, pregnancy or sexual encounters in, in the months following. Um, but otherwise, in general, post-travel precautions, not much. You know, obviously, we, we tell people before they're going for the trip, if you develop a fever, you know, this is something that you need to get evaluated because it could end up being a more severe um, illness. Um, and I guess kind of along the lines of malaria, we do inform people that they could present, you know, fairly late depending on the species of malaria. But typically for the arboviruses, they present in a pretty short time period after travel, typically within a week, um, people are going to have um, their symptoms. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more? Do you have a question there? Um, so let's see, I have one here that says that we kind of focus mostly on dengue, chikungunya, et cetera, so mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, what about tick-borne diseases, which constitute a large proportion of travel-related diseases, um, and how do you easily diagnose um, these related diseases? So personally, I find this very challenging um, for a lot of tick-borne related illnesses. I don't have as great of, you know, easy diagnostic testing, and I think there can be a lot of variability depending on where people go. Um, kind of not the focus of, of everything this morning, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have any other easier answers for that. Sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> 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 Diagnosis of tick-borne arboviruses. <laughs> No, I do agree with tick-borne diseases. Mm -hmm. is a very similar situation. Some of the cases of the history of the tick-borne diseases mm -hmm. in the Midwest that we have, the issue of the you know the the the, the, the bull ring that we see, but um, but definitely there is a, a major concern with tick-borne diseases as well. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Uh, is that finished? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to miss in third trip. Uh, you want to know the expe the expectation of the diagnosis, why is it so important, and uh, what does it mean to distinguish one virus from another, especially since there's uh, no difference in the treatment. And, well, that is uh, uh, not only, uh, it, it's correct, but the, you, you know the expectancy. If you, if you have dengue and you know that uh, it had, may have a biphasic uh, ep uh, episode where you have a, a defervescence, and for 12 to 24 hours, you think the patient is getting better, and then the patient, the, the, the fever increases, then comes the rash, and then it becomes the hepatobilemia, the, the thrombocytopenia. So it is um, important to, to, to see if, that is, if it's that, or it's just chikungunya, because chikungunya, you know, it more or less the, the natural course of the disease. And in, the, in chikungunya, you should know, because you might have later on consequences, like myocarditis. I have... Uh, uh, my my son-in-law is being followed by a cardiologist because he has a uh, Wolf Parkinson White, and all of a sudden he says, "You you, you don't you, this is something strange. You have a myocarditis. A my, myocarditis. They did all the testing. It was from chikungunya, and he never even had the symptoms, but it was caused by the chikungunya. So it is important to try to find out. But uh, uh, basically, uh, it's just uh, stabilize him uh, uh, the, the the patient." Uh, need to know if she should be at, at his home or if she should be at the hospital. The, in the slide that the doctor put about the, the complications, once you see those slides, that patient should be in an, e, an intensive care unit because his mortality is, is, is very high. So that's why uh, you should try to uh, diagnose which of the, the diseases there are. Um, I have one. It says, how do we reconcile trying to get patients to comply with precautions? And they kind of use an example of, of people masking and things like that related with, with COVID. Um, that's something I'm still personally working on as a healthcare provider who does free travel counseling. I think, you know, the best thing we can do is education for individuals so they really understand what the risks are of not complying with mosquito precautions. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to those people if they have that information to kind of make their, you know, make their own decisions about whether they're going to put their deed on and wear their long sleeves on a hot day um, when they're on a safari or whatever they're going to do. But um, that definitely is something that I, you know, we spend a decent amount of our travel visits, especially when people are going to areas with malaria or other mosquito-borne arboviruses, um, really providing that counseling. Um, yeah, how many of those people listen to me? I don't know. <laughs> 
Uh, one question that I have here, how do you feel, um, do you feel that surveillance testing of vectors can be a useful tool for informing public health and medical, medical officials? And of course it is. You know, I think there is many places where um, you know, surveillance testing on mosquitoes is, is, is being done in some parts of the U.S. and also you know, allows us to know um, about the prevalence of the transmission of some of these arboviruses. So it is, it is important to have surveillance testing. Uh, I have a question about comorbidities. Is there a way, I mean, there are several other di diseases for which there are diagnostic algorithms. Why do we not have any for our arboviral diseases? Who should be prioritized for a specific diagnosis? What is the comorbidity that goes with certain diseases so that you can prioritize those patients for those comorbidities? Because those are at high risk of going further into the disease. So are there things being thought about in the arboviral <laughs> Uh, I mean, at least at ACAV, we should think about such diagnostic uh, algorithms to be developed. Well, who is going to do the algorithms? It depends on the, the State Department. Uh, or or there, there's, is, uh, we cannot tell you exactly what, uh, what to do. Uh, it depends on the organization. Correct. So what I'm saying is, are we are, are we collecting that data? So are, are we making that kind of decisions? Are we seeing, do we have any kind of data that arboviral disease can cause a higher uh, loss of life or higher morbidity or higher mortality when they have this, say, diabetes, say, obesity? So those patients can be then prioritized for certain diagnostics which are very expensive in certain areas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the CDC, I think it would be for uh, on the CDC to, to collect that data. Collecting data and surveillance is very important. And the more we know, the more, uh, the more data we know, the more we can uh, either come up with algorithms or come up with suggestions, or somebody can come up with a bright, bright idea on how to control the mosquitoes, mm -hmm. right? They used to say well, for, for the Aedes aegypti, uh, put uh, bug zappers, and we know that the Aedes Mosquito does not like light; it likes darkness. So, but that's why they hide under the beds. So they invented the the uh, the traps that are dark, uh, like they're dark. They have a glue inside, and uh, depending on on the time, that you can uh, count the mosquitoes and uh, from, from areas. And uh, well, I know there were, where surveillance is being taken. They said we we're a high count of of of, of mosquitoes since we're trapping them more. That doesn't mean that they're dying more. That means that there's more in circulation. And that information uh, must be regional uh, for uh, either the states or uh, any other country. And we've been focused uh, mainly on the human side of the equation, but don't forget the animals. Uh, so many of the emerging diseases are zoonotic classical example was Japanese encephalitis that moved southward in Australia and involved four states. And it was first became apparent in pig production. And I think that's a strong argument for One Health approaches so that when one thinks of the ecological settings where these diseases are occurring, they may be occurring in animals sometimes before and ahead of people and so there needs to be ongoing uh, communication between people involved in animal health and people involved in human health. Uh, Crimean Congro hemorrhagic fever has turned up in Spain. And so these diseases don't stay put. Mm -hmm. And I think that argues strongly for the need of one health approaches with ongoing adequate communication with laboratory support on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one comment I can make there, um, yellow fever, for example, in the Americas, you know, um, many non-human primates, and you know, as you probably know, in, in Brazil were affected or have been affected by yellow fever, but we don't have a method to make vaccines easily, that can be easily administered to wildlife in the, in, or to, to, to wild, wild species. So I think that's definitely an effort that, it's, that you mentioned, important to have the One Health approach uh, for some of these arboviruses that are also uh, affecting tarsonotic. 
So two quick, um, hopefully practical clinical comments. Um, I didn't hear anything mentioned about in dengue, typically we avoid NSAIDs um, as opposed to the other illnesses. So that would kind of respond a little bit to the question about should we actually try to figure out which arbovirus it is. Or perhaps when folks come with these conditions and they're febrile, we should just say acetaminophen all the time and, and discourage um, NSAIDs. Uh, and then the second thing as far as uh, protection from mosquitoes, I found in my patients that recommending Picardin is very, very helpful. It seems as though people accept that better. They'll actually put that on every day uh, in the travelers as opposed to DEET, which is kind of oily and greasy and mm -hmm. people really don't like putting it on. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of practical things. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate for this kind of meet. It was fantastic. Everybody had the opportunity to talk and to interact. My question is, Based in the knowledge that you have in immunology, can you predict when you have the next outbreak of Zika? <laughs> you, you want me to be grounds, don't you? So <laughs> no, I don't think we can, but I think what we should do is do surveillance. You know, I think that that's why we have to continue with this um, you know, field surveillance. And, and, and I think this, what we learned from COVID is also, you know, like, the, the, the hot spots that we have for arboviruses and, and focus in those areas and be ready for the emerging arbovirus that will be there. So, the, like, it ha but it has to be, you know, a mixture of different things. We need better diagnostics. There's definitely, there need to be more practical, but also in the field, if you are in the middle of the Amazons, how is it for you to do PCR sometimes? You know, that's not so simple. Okay. Um, and then also when you are seeing all this cluster of patients, perhaps, you know, like we're doing in fever clinics, so um, there's all these clusters that all of a sudden start coming. So I think that's why you need to pay attention to, to, to data. So um, data needs to be maybe di digitalized and being able to analyze data in a different way now that maybe that's what we learned from COVID. We are not doing that in, in the tropics sometimes, you know, because the conditions that we have. So I agree that we need, we need to be prepared, but have to do more field surveillance. There's a saying, just when you think you know something, <laughs> something changes. So if we were to expect, uh, uh, like the dengue has a more or less five or seven years, when, when you're not expecting it, comes, uh, it might come earlier, it might come late. Uh, we, don't, we can't control them. Uh, so it's better to be prepared. Yeah, I think you just have to assume it'll come back at some point, so you gotta be ready when, for it. When you least expect it. <laughs> I have a question about regarding yellow fever vaccine. Um, so have there been many cases of uh, the serious viscerotropic or there's also the neurotropic uh, syndrome associated in patients greater than 65 who receive the vaccine and do you still recommend the vaccine to older patients traveling to endemic areas um, or should they just avoid travel there? Um, so yeah, there is, even though in general the yellow fever vaccine is really safe, it is a live vaccine and there are um, some potential serious risks. I wanna say, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's like one in a few hundred thousand um, for each of these um, side effects, um, either the neurotropic or the viscerotropic. Um, and that risk is slightly increased in individuals who are elderly. Um, I definitely am, I avoid it in people who are um, typically immunocompromised. Um, for older patients, it kind of depends a little bit on the risk benefit. So, you know, how important is this trip to them? What are they going to be doing on the trip? Are they going to be, you know, backpacking through the Amazon? Or are they going to be in an air-conditioned hotel room for 24 hours on, you know, a brief stopover? Um, and so, you know, you kind of basically have to assess what is their potential risk of getting yellow fever versus what is their potential risk from the vaccine, and then kind of make a risk benefit um, analysis and kind of talk through the patient with those. So, um, yes, I will vaccinate people, I think, that are at high risk who are older than 65 if I think it's worth it for them and they're okay with that. Hi, thank you so much for an amazing talk. It's been really enjoyable and really educational. I had a quick question about, you spoke of a new arbovirus or new to us arbovirus in Brazil. Could you speak a bit more about that? Um, well, uh, it is Oropuche. Okay, that I mentioned, but it's not really new. It has been around for a long time. Okay, it was isolated in Jamaica. I think it was in the 1970s or, or 50s. I, I could be wrong about that date. 
But what happens is that many cases, um, they look like dengue. You know, they look very similar to dengue or chikungunya or, or some of the other arboviruses. The issue that we have is that they, it's, it's all acute febrile illness, okay? Um, so we are finding that in the study that we just published in Colombia, that 16% um, of, of the patients that were negative for dengue were actually positive for Oropuche. Now, the, the, the way that we had to do this is by viral discovery, you know, metagenomic sequencing and trying to find this and develop a PCR test and IgM test, but those tests are not commercially available. So I think that also goes to the point that we need better diagnostics in general. And then we went back to read the literature, and it's very common in Ecuador, it's very common in, in Peru, in, in kind of in those areas, so there's two different cycles. There is an urban cycle, which is in large, um, you know, large cities, but there's also a, a kind of a sylvatic cycle that, that is, you know, people living in, in forest areas and so on. So in Brazil, you know, actually has been considered like second to dengue um, in terms of uh, endemicity. Okay. I have a question on any news about a Zika vaccine and do we have more tools and will we be better prepared next time we have an outbreak to prevent Zika congenital syndrome? Um, so I believe there are companies that are working towards the Zika vaccine maybe more in the early phases, but I might have to open that up to my colleagues to see if they have any more in-depth information than I do on that one. Yes, there are early phase uh, studies mm -hmm. for, for Zika vaccine. Uh, results are not yet in and we, we should wait until uh, we, we have something. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, when we get that vaccine, what are we going to do? Who are we going? Are we going to uh, uh, say for general population, or are we going to specify as mainly for the reproduct female, free pro free reproductive uh, uh, persons? Are, is it going to? Are the tests going to be done on females who are already pregnant and uh, who's, who are the most affected? Because the Zika, basically, it's the microcephaly, which. Uh, hurts us more. So there are many questions that must be answered depending on what comes out of the uh, the studies. Also, th th there is um, efforts in Zika, but the issue is that there is no enough cases. Uh, so many companies have dropped the development of the Zika vaccine mm -hmm. because uh, to do a phase three trial, you really need a large population. Okay, so that's that's the unfortunate situation. So. I think uh, the efforts should be to develop a vaccine that proves to be safety to phase one, perhaps, okay, and have it ready for a stockpile. I think we need to have, in my opinion, a stockpile of some of the arboviral um, diseases, and some of them, you know, actually that we can demonstrate correlates with protection. We can actually find new ways to get um, over that age that you need a large population for efficacy trials. So. And we can demonstrate correlates of protection for some of the arboviral diseases. There is data out there, mm -hmm. and maybe trying to get um, approval based on uh, correlates of protection. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Mine is just um, a comment. I, I think one critical part of the control or prevention of this arbovirus is awareness creation. And I think even in this room, many people are not even aware of uh, about viral diseases. So I think we need to continue to create the awareness among policymakers and you know people who can put investment into this uh, developing some of these diagnostics. Uh, because if we have to learn anything from COVID, we don't have to wait till this disease becomes an outbreak before we start uh, looking out for diagnostic uh, methods for 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 getting this disease, uh, you know. Um, controlled. So my comment or my suggestion would be that we should continue the awareness creation among communities and once they know the bedding and the risks, then they will take to make effort to protect themselves and also get the critical investment we need in mm -hmm. the, um, you know in controlling the disease. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think we've, we've learned a lot, hopefully learned some lessons the last three years about about being more prepared um, when when things pop up. I know the, uh, the WHO earlier this year announced a global health initiative against arboviruses. So, you know, kind of hopefully trying to focus on surveillance, diagnostics, prevention. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, kind of with, with that behind, if, if that can help with some of that. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with that. Mm, 
Oh, and I was just going to mention, um, for those of you uh, that are in clinical medicine or doing pre-travel counseling or um, are just curious, um, the CDC Yellow Book and website um, is a great, uh, has great up-to-date health information about specific locations um, that can be great for counseling your patients and kind of uh, refreshing yourself <laughs> about it's hard to memorize what's going on in every part of the world when we have enough to think about so it's great I, I do it all the, even though I do pre-travel counseling I still um, reference individual countries for every trip that I'm doing to make sure I'm aware of what's what's happening hi thank you very much um, you mentioned three of the four viruses being Flavi viruses mm -hmm. and one being an alpha in the arboviral world, do you think Flavi viruses are our greatest concern? I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say yes. Okay. Think we're good? Okay, well, so I'd like to thank you all for um, attending the, this great seminar, and I'd like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Kruger and Dr. Isern, for um, a, great, a great event. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for coming.